Okay, so what I was, I, I have established my problem. And I've written it in my sketchbook, 7069 San Antonio. Let me just make it really clear. And you can do this for yourself for whatever problem you're working on. But my problem is how do I make it interesting? How do I make 1769 San Antonio engaging to my audience? That is always the problem of the artist. Right? So this whole section, my brainstorming, what do I already know? This is incredibly important to do and actually write down so you can refer back to it. Because otherwise it can be a trap. Brainstorming does this. It acknowledges the cliche. The easy ideas. And in art, where you are basically selling your ideas, your creativity, your, your point of view on the world, that's a little askew from the ordinary. You have to acknowledge the cliches early so that you can be aware of them. They're not just cliches. They are biases that you have. They are stereotypes. They are judgments, right? You're reacting to a song. What if you don't like the song? You know, that doesn't mean you, you get to get away from it. So you want to acknowledge that. And you want to write that down. Oh, here's another guitar, bass, you know, <laughs> small rock ensemble song. So you write, like, I, I'm really sick of small ensemble music, whatever it is, right? Acknowledge it so you can get over it, so you can get past it. So next comes research. Now, research is to give you more to react to. Artists get in trouble when they think they have enough on their own. Artists get in trouble when they think that inside their own head, are, that's where all the answers are. And that's why artists who are more accomplished, more interesting, have longer careers, are big historians of art, are big historians of illustration, are big um, experimenters of media. You know, They don't pigeonhole themselves. You want to give yourself more to react to. So research can take a while. It's part of the effort. It's, it's reading texts. It's going to the libraries. It's asking like research librarians, especially for something like this, which is a very historical project. And once you've done that, you're going to have more to react to. And basically research, you are looking for questions to answer. Right? And those questions for me were who? Who is involved in 1769? Um, how were the events significant? Right? The why? Kind of journalistic questions. My problem already had the where and the when. 1769 is the when. San Antonio is the where. I'm trying to, to figure out this other stuff. You know, what aspects are pertinent? especially the what, what visuals, right? 1769 is before photography. Photography didn't start until 1830. That makes it tough. So what I looked at is I looked at uh, historical documents, records, not just of 1769, but of, you know, that whole range. I especially looked for things with the Comanche and their impact on San Antonio's population. I looked for uh, any images I could find that would work and kind of bring, a, bring about the idea of that time period, even if it wasn't related to San Antonio, because there weren't a lot of working artists in San Antonio in 1769. And in general, I looked at what's called tangential information. 
So I learned that the French kind of paired up with the Comanches, kind of funded the Comanches, and were using them to kind of weaken this territory so that they could invade it and hold it longer from other European interests. So what, what's tangential um, to the French in San Antonio? Things like French uniforms, right? French officers, French fashions. <laughs> I looked at the, the history of the missions, you know, all of this is tangential to the indigenous people and the indigenous arts, you know, which is mostly kind of beaded things and all that. So you research and then you, you get more. And then, very important step. The next thing you do, so this is first, you define your problem. Second, and you acknowledge the cliche. Second, you research to give yourself more to react to. And then fourth, you sleep on it. You get away from the problem. And that's because with getting ideas, brute force does not work. And this is even true if you're on a one day deadline. You have to come up with a brilliant idea. You have to do it in the next 10 hours. You don't spend nine hours trying to think of a good idea. You spend two hours brainstorming, researching, and then you do something totally other. If it was a job where it was a cover that I was doing, then I would treat myself to a steak dinner, right? And I'd force myself, I'd have my sketchbook with me, but I'd force myself to eat and not draw and just think about other stuff. And maybe I'd invite a friend or whatever. Make your mind do something else. Because if you've acknowledged the problem, your mind will work on it. And if you've given it research, if you've given it stuff to react to, your, your brain is going to, your subconscious is going to be trying to make sense of things. It's why we get good ideas in our dreams and when we wake up in the morning, right? So you have to sleep on it. You need to give it some time. Okay, and then step two. The second phase, so that's phase one. I want you to do that phase before Thanksgiving. <laughs> I want you to, to get excited about this project, jump right in. Some of you are already already to the idea phase, but I want you to, to question, did I really acknowledge all of the cliches first? Did I, did I really acknowledge all of my biases first? And just put them down, because you can indulge those things, but be aware of them. And did I do enough research that I have something to react to? Or am I gonna be working naively? And working naively is dangerous, because someone in your audience might know more about it than you do. Right? And because you're all reacting to the same thing, you might write something in your artist statement that makes it really clear that you only listen to half of the song. Right? And then your audience is gonna say, yeah, but the second part of the song like totally shows that that was all made up or something, I don't know. You can get found out very easily if you don't do your research and acknowledge your biases. So I'll call this phase two And this is building your idea. Okay, first stage of phase two, sky's the limit. I told you this project needs to fit in the room, right? But I don't even want you to acknowledge that limitation when you're just first thinking. What would be the coolest way to make this engaging, right? And so sky's the limit. I might think things like, I wanna build a Comanche headdress. And instead of it just being like a buffalo head or a cliches of like feathers, right? I want it to have all this stuff in it that shows all the different cultures of San Antonio. You know, so I'd have like French braids and beadwork and Mayan carving. And I could put little notes 
and horns and antlers and arrowheads. And I don't know where I would buy all this stuff, but I would build it, and that's going to be the piece that has all that pizzazz in that show. And I'm not even going to worry about practical concerns about how will I transport it, how will I display it, how will I make sure it stays put. I don't know how to sew. How do I hold it all together? Don't worry about that, right? Try to find the, the way into the idea that appeals to you, that gets you excited. The approach path. And it needs to give you energy. You're basically giving yourself a new problem here, but it's a more narrow problem. So what aspect of this project, what approach to it can give you enough energy that you want to figure it out, no matter what it takes? Okay, you can sketch, you can write for your sky's the limit, but you want to define your solution. And I don't write very fast <laughs> with the tablet here. But basically, that's one approach. Now, what's another sky's the limit approach? Is there anything else I could be as excited about? I want to do a full-size horse. I want to carve it out of wood. I've always loved wood carving. And that's a pretty indigenous art form. And I want to just have it be uh, created entirely out of colorful beads and saddled with French lace. Now, sky's the limit ideas are not good ideas always, right? They're impulsive. And they're ideas that you take seriously. Artists are the people that are arrogant enough to take their ideas seriously. No matter how silly they are. Okay. So I have one solution. Here's a second solution. And then we want to, next step, interrogate the idea. Be hostile to it, like you interrogate a witness. All right, so Comanche headdress idea. That looks expensive, <laughs> right? This is where practical concerns come in. Can you really afford, do you have the time to, to do all that beadwork, to learn to sew, to, to get arrowheads and swords? and French, a French uniform epaulets and collars, you know. Um, have you ever made a headdress before? It's like Comic Con's coming up. Do you really want to make your costume the night before? <laughs> that kind of thing. Practical concerns, they matter, right? It doesn't work to have a hugely great ambitious idea and not be able to deliver anything on it. So acknowledge these. Time. Technique. Um, display. The full-size horse. I have a 1994 Honda Civic hatchback. Right? How am I going to deliver that horse to the gala? That kind of thing. Cost. All of these are practical concerns. Now, they can be discouraging, but what they help you see is number three. Use your strengths. I am not good at sewing. I am not good at spending money. I'm very miserly. What am I good at? I'm good at doing works on paper with cheap materials. <laughs> And so what are my strengths? My strengths are doing 2D imagery. My strengths are using...